I'll start by uh, a small incident that happened. So five years back, I was asked to deliver a TED talk by a group of engineering students from Kochi Model Engineering College. They asked me to talk about one topic, opportunity finds passion. And the person who invited me told me clearly, so please say that, tell people not to follow their passions, but to be pragmatic and grab the opportunities that come their way. I did that. I did that, one, because I was invited and asked to do so. But more importantly, I believed that you should be pragmatic more than being passionate. Because pragmatism only helps you to fill your stomach. Pragmatism only gives you, only pragmatism will help you to have decent clothes and housing. Passion will not do anything on those goals. So only if you have the basic comforts and uh, necessities can you think about passion. So I spoke accordingly. Also, one more reason was that I, I had always thought of myself as a bit of a drifter. I was interested in a lot of things. I did MBBS, I left that. I like cricket, I like reading, I like history, I like so many things. So I never thought that, thought that I was passionate about anything. So I thought passion is for some great people. I, I'm a person who is much more ordinary person who is not staying to happy. A couple of years later, uh, I was uh, had an incident that I couldn't park a car where I wanted to, so I had to walk some distance. It was a month of May. Walk about uh, 15 minutes to reach the place I wanted to, and I was walking back. It was very hot, it was very sultry, and I was sweating. And as it happened, when you are sweating, you curse everybody. When I got into the car, I suddenly thought, Oh God, when I was a child, I used to look forward to months of April and May because I could play the whole day. The schools are closed. Why is that I'm not able to have the same spirit now? Then it struck me that I liked, absolutely loved playing, which was the reason why I did not feel the sun, I did not feel the heat, I did not feel the sweat, I did not think about getting a tan while playing in the sun, the thoughts which come to my mind now. Compared to a situation where you are going with the elderly uncle in a train and the train is two hours late. What will you do? You will curse the uncle, you will curse the train, you will curse the railways, you will curse everyone. But think you are going in the same train with your boyfriend or girlfriend and the train is late. You will actually be happy. You will wish that the train keeps on getting late because you can spend much more time. That was the situation I was in because when I was at that age, I, I was playing cricket, I never wanted the days to it. I wanted the sun to continue being there so that I could continue to play. Then I realized, God, that is a passion I had. So it, it took me, I, I realized what my passion was only in my 50th year of life. I was probably 55 at that time in 2019. So passion is something which is there in all of us. I, I got into cricket in a very strange way. My father wanted me to read the newspaper Hindu. You would have seen the Hindu newspaper. It's not an easy thing to read. As a child, when I was in third standard and fourth standard, he'll ask me to read Hindu. And then I will read it without understanding anything. Then he saw that there's a trick to make me read Hindu, so he taught me the fundamentals of cricket. And Hindu used to cover cricket matches very well. Those were the days of uh, when England team was coming to India for it, was a lot of coverage about cricket. Small amount of cricket fever was there. So I got hooked on to the game. And I became compulsively hooked on to it ever since. When I was to join the new school and there was an entrance test, my father did not do anything. He just showed me the ground and told me I could play there every day if I got admission. So I studied well and got to the school. After completing class 10, I had fairly good marks. As it happens, parents are what do you want? I asked for a set of leg guards. So looking back, it looked very stupid, but that was what I wanted. So I was so much involved with cricket. That was saying about umpiring. So my dream was. Not to become an umpire. My dream was to become a player. I wanted to play along with Gavaskar, Kapil Dev, and the lot. And I used to muck up all the statistics. I used to follow all the matches, listen to commentary. Those days there was not even TV. So listen to commentary, write down scores. Even if you ask me in the middle of the night, how much Gavaskar scored in distance, I would be able to say that. If there was a place in the site for someone who muck up statistics, I would have got it. Unfortunately, what happened was that my interest in the game and my performance on the field did not match. I thought that I had the capacity to become a great player, but unfortunately, whenever I went out to bat, I could not make the runs. With difficulty, I managed to district team. I reached up to the level of the state junior side, which wasn't saying much because Kerala side used to get all over 50 and 60 against Tamil Nadu. Then I realized that 
Then one day I saw a small clipping in the newspaper saying that there's a clinic for cricket umpires. It was vacation time. Anyway, I saw I went and attended the clinic. Then I heard about the loss of cricket. I had been playing the game, but I did not know that so many laws existed in this matter. One elderly gentleman was taking the class. I attended the class. So at the end of it, they said there were two-day class. They said there's an exam the next day. Why don't you have to write a paper and 10 rupees or something? So I told my father, got the money, paid the amount and took the exam. I was good at study, so passing the exam was not a problem. Then only I came to know that this was the first such exam being conducted by Kerala Cricket Association for a panel of affairs. Then they said that there has to be one more, the practical and viva. So when I went for the practical and viva, I found that uh, I was only 16 years old. All the others were considerably older than me. And they all looked umpire-like. I, I was still a kid. And uh, I would not have done very well in the practical and bio because I had umpired only class matches. So what would I have done? But this uh, gentleman asked me questions because I knew the theory well I answered. And then he told me, see, you are too young to become an umpire. What if you promise me that you will umpire, you'll be sincere to this task, I will pass you. Yes, sir, I'll be sincere to your task. So he passed me. The result was that at the age of 17, I started umpiring inter-district matches, single zone matches and all that. And one of the people who passed with me, those two singers, went to the Ranjit Trophy panel next year. So that became a goal. Those days, Ranjit Trophy used to be played by people like Kapil Dev, Sandeep Patel, Gavaskar, Vangsarkar and all that. So umpiring a Ranjit Trophy was a big thing. So I thought if I become a Ranjit Trophy umpire, at least I can make up for the disappointment of not becoming a Ranjit Trophy player. That was how it started. And then I got into medical college. So again, the exam schedule comes in and I like you people know how, how bad it is in a course like that. In a course, course. But then I always just find time for umpiring. So five, six years continuously, I went for all the matches. I would umpire for Kerala. I would umpire right from uh, Kanu down to Trivandrum. Almost all the grounds in those days I had umpired. I used to bunk classes, cut classes and go and umpire. So I wanted to become a regiment of umpire. But Cricket Control Board in his wisdom did not conduct exams every year. After 82, the next exam was in 90. And I had stopped umpiring in 86, 87. I got the final year of NCTS. I had to study to pass that. I passed that. Then I got married. Then I put my for civil service. In 1990, one week after the results of civil service came and I qualified, came the news that there was going to be an umpire's time of BCC. Well, then I was lucky. I wrote the exam. I passed it. Then I was lucky with the practical as I got. And uh, I was actually at the right place at the right time because those days one did not have to umpire too many matches. You can umpire from four or five matches in a year and then you can remain the fan. These days you had to umpire for at least 15 to 60 days in a year. Those days 15 to 30 days or something. Anyway, my bosses were good to me. They were all cricket fans and gently helped me in my career also. I'll come to that later. That is how I came into umpiring. But looking back, I realized that it was something you call a made for each other. I was mad about the game. I had some amount of academic inclination. Empire needs both. So it was a perfect marriage. Whereas if I had continued my this thing as a player, maybe I would have tried and tried and tried. And maybe in another five or ten years, I would have stopped playing. And at the end of it, I would have left the game and uh, just followed it okay. But as umpiring it helped me to remain in touch with the game. So, advantages that I got of umpiring were many. One, uh, it helped me to remain physically and mentally fit. You would have seen cricket matches on TV, you would have seen it live. Have you ever seen an umpire leaving a field for a cup of water or for going to the toilet? You would never have seen it. Have you ever seen an umpire reaching the ground late? You would never have seen it. So, umpire is one person who is not over the level, from the club level up to the highest level, umpire has a certain discipline, which automatically gets inculcated into it. So whatever you do, you know that you have to stand in the sun for six hours and you cannot take a break. So that brings its own discipline. Two, you have to give a decision. When a player appeals, you cannot do any other thing. You cannot think over it. You have to give a decision, is he out, is he not out. If the bowler oversteps, you have a split second to see it and then call a no ball. When it comes to judging a bite, you just see it happen and you make a call. So it helps you to improve your decision making capacity. But most important was that it helped me to stay grounded. Well, I told you I had gotten to civil service at 90. It's a good job. It's the best job that government of India can offer. You go to a certain high level in life. 
there are a lot of people working on you. Everyone calls you sir. So people come and wait to meet you. It gives you a cocked up importance. Oh, okay, you are a great man. This sort of thing is there. But when you go to a cricket field as an umpire, you are just an umpire. Players don't know where he's Aston Commissioner or a deputy director or an additional commissioner. They just see you as an umpire. And what do players do when they don't get a favorable decision? How many of you play cricket? You play some games more. If you don't get a favorable decision, you curse. That's a normal thing. So I have been subject to a lot of abuse. When you, when you give a note out, the bowler will shout at you. When you uh, get saved, give a bad note, he will curse you. So this cursing relentlessly is something that happened. But the beauty of it is that it helps you to stay grounded. I cannot say I will issue a memo to you for cursing. I cannot say I will husband you for cursing. It doesn't happen. Because in this field, that is part of it. So for a comfortable portion of my life, that sort of balancing came in, which was very important. So I gained a lot of that. Well, uh, I was lucky to compare uh, one day internationals and all that. It just happened because I was in the right place at the right time. But more importantly, I told you that my father wanted me to reach Hindu. That was the second there was a quick pro on that. The other half was it, it helped my reading habit, particularly reading of English. So I used to read the sports columns of newspapers. That way I got interested in history. So that way the reading habit picked up. I, I always thought that I was a reader, not a writer. Only article I wrote was on for a college magazine because my roommate was an editor. He wanted me to write on cricket. I wrote an article on cricket. That's all. In 1999, I remember very clearly Sometime in the month of April, I got a call from M.K. Munir. You must I remember the name. He was a minister. Munir was a classmate in medical college. So he told me, we used to talk on phone. So he called me and said, Raghavji, how are you? I said, I'm fine. How are you? He said, I'm fine. He said, why don't you write a book? So he cracks a lot of jokes. So I thought it must be another of his jokes. I said, yes, yes, I'll write a book. And he said, I'm serious. Why don't you write a book? And I said, you cannot be serious because I don't write. He said, no. We have only publications. We have planned to come out in the English publishing. So we can start with cricket. The World Cup is coming. So why don't we write a book on World Cup? I said, I need to think about it. He said, no, no, don't think about it. You write it. I went home that evening and told it to my wife and daughter. My wife laughed at it and said that that guy must be crazy. But my daughter encouraged me. He said, Sir, you must do it. Daughters are instantly the dad's greatest friends. So I got motivation from that and I said, yes. I, I knew that nobody else had asked me to write something, so I said yes. I wrote it quickly. In two months, the World Cup was starting in June. I had to complete it. So something about the World Cup history, we wrote, we published it. But the important thing was not the contents of the book, but once the job was being done, I realized that I actually loved writing. I did not know this. I thought that after I got into the service, the government job, one writes only office-related matters. But when I started writing about and about general things, it gave me a lot of happiness. So for the next four or five years, from 2000 to probably 2006, 7, I used to write whenever I felt like it. I had to publish it. But when I felt I the need to write, I would write. Then I went to Singapore. It was a posting which uh, I got. I was working in the High Commission. I met a gentleman called Pradeep Wong. He used to be working with a magazine called Sports World. And then he had moved to Singapore to work at Singapore uh, Straight Times. We got talking and uh, he was impressed by the fact that I was an umpire and I had written. And he said, why don't you write a column for this periodical that we bring out for the Indian community? And he said, of course, I don't know. He said, just try it. So I, I wrote a column. Uh, I wrote something and sent to him. He modified a bit and published it. The beauty was that a lot of people called up to compare it. Maybe because of the post I was holding, maybe because they thought it is nice to do it. Some maybe because they liked it. But it made me tremendously happy that this happened. So I started writing regularly for that. And then I understood the importance of how to write a column. You have to keep it in 800 words just to be a contemporary topic. And if you exceed the 800 words, probably somebody will slash it down, the editor will come in. So the minimal use of words, how to express something with the cogently, clearly, crisply, within the limitations of the space, all that I learned there. This conference helped me to write the book on what, what uh, uh, Dr. Ajit said about India-China war, the dividing line. I was interested in the topic, so I wrote about it. So this, this became a habit. So by that time, I stopped umpiring, writing and reading became a sort of 
a passion. So I was very lucky in this area. It was much later that I learned about the concept of Ikigai. I am sure some of you have heard of Ikigai. Ikigai actually has, let's think about four circles. The one circle is what do you love? The things that you love. Second circle, that's a concentric circle that comes in is are you good at it? Third is does the world need it? And fourth is is it remunerated broadly? So if you love something, well, you love a lot of things. You love music, you love dance, you love movie, you love acting, you may love painting, you may love reading. Second question is, are you good at it? No, I, I love music, but I know that with my voice, I cannot be an Ashra. So forget about it. There's no point in loving music and then doing it because you're not good at it. So you have to be good at it. Third is, does the world need it? Is there a demand for it? And fourth is, is it remunerated? Then all these four spots needs, it's called the sweet spot. If you're able to achieve that well, then that is your passion that can sustain your life. Every day morning when you wake up in life, you have a reason to go forward. That's the sweet spot that is there. Looking back to 2019, after that incident, and when I read about Ikigai, I realized that I was fortunate to have the Ikigai sweet spot of my life. I've been trying to replace that by writing, but not with the same amount of success. So what I would tell you all is that you're all bright and good. You're all going to get good jobs, but all of you have passion with you. Realize that passion. Cherish it, nourish it, nurture it, help it grow. That will sustain you. Some of us, not I say some of you, might be fortunate in having your profession as a passion. Let's take the case of Amitabh Bachchan. He had a job with a wonderful company. He left it and went to Bombay and started acting. It was a great risk, but he followed his passion. His work became his passion. Or somebody like Sachin Tendulkar, somebody like Bill Gates, or even a prime minister. How do you think they are able to work 16 and 18 hours a day? It's because there's a passion. Every day morning when they wake up, they know this is something that I have to do because it gives me happiness. That inner happiness comes from me. Amitabh Bachchan doesn't need money now. He would have made more money than three generations can spend. But he still goes over the same amount of zeal and zest because that's a passion that sustains him. So when work becomes a passion, when the profession becomes a passion, you reach an altogether different level. Not many of us will be lucky on that. Those of you are lucky on that, yes, you can do it. Think about doctors. There are Dr. Joe Periabram who does heart transplant. So many surgeries he does. Four days in a week, four or five days in a week he operates. And the operations are from eight in the morning to six in the evening. Just imagine standing for 10 hours without a wavering of concentration, he does it. Why does he do it? Not for money. Because that is passion. That is where his professional, professional and the passion that reached that Ikigai sweet spot. That is why they are doing it. So find out what your passions are and nurture it. That will make you a better person. That will make you a happy person. That will make you a contented person. We all will have, we all get jobs, we all do well in life. But that doesn't necessarily make you happy and content. You have to have that second actualization coming in. You have to rise above that. For rising above that, you need a passion. So if you can write, read, sing, dance, whatever, nothing is too big, nothing is too small, because it is yours. Spend one or two hours a day on that. That will help you to become better. This is something you say twice. If I am in an interview board, and I'm asked to choose between two people. I choose a person who has a proper hobby. Why? Because a person who has a proper hobby is a person who knows how to relax. A person who knows how to manage stuff. And as you go up in life, your decisions are marked by how you are able to handle stress and tension. That will be the most important. So we are all are technically good. How can you choose between a guy who scores 99% and a guy who scores 97%? Both of you are equally good. But a person who is having a good hobby will be able to handles stress. He will be able to have better work-life uh, relationship. He will be able to have spend his, utilize his time much better. So that is the concept I say. Hey, discover your passion. Nurture, cherish, nourish, whatever you can, so that it remains within you. All the stresses in your life can be absorbed. It becomes a huge shock absorber. It will absorb all the difficulties in your life and take you further. I, I will not talk more because uh, already been 20-25 minutes. Yep. 
and I know that attention span is short, so and I don't want to see any of you dropping off. So I'll stop now. It has been a wonderful experience. If you have any questions to ask, you can ask me. Otherwise, thank you very much, and I leave the floor of that. Once again, thank you very much to the organizer for giving me this opportunity. It's a matter of great pride for me to be amongst young minds like you. Have a good day, and God bless you. Thank you. Hello, sir. Can I ask a question? Hello, sir. Can I ask a question? So you spoke about the process from the process. So what's the case always on how do you do your process? Yeah, uh, mostly that's what the case. Nobody has said no. Uh, there are one or two very difficult people who said who grumbled, but then finally said yes. But generally, all the bosses have accepted the thing that uh, well, he has reached this level of okay, so let him pursue his hobby for five or ten days. That that at two or second day, most of the people. So I do not have any problem with that. Uh, and I also uh, have been liberal in the same story. Someone wants to post Hello. Ask them any not not be sports. Any people don't that.
beach for getting into that with the mutual. So this is a much more easier, effective method of getting into it. And watching these events happen, like what you say about watching sporting events happen is a great thing. So the sports coverage in Hindu, I mentioned the board was on the days that we couldn't see the match on the ground. Now you can see the game on the ground. If you see the World Cup final and the fight between Messi and Mbappe, you don't need to read about it. You have witnessed it. So any amount of writing will not be able to bring the same flavor, excitement, and uh, joy of witnessing it. So that is why I said this has changed because the medium through which we want to implement has changed. Us. So the new generation is doing well, I would say. And new generation should not be reading news. I will not hear it. You can read newspapers when you have those things, but they access a better source of information. Hello. Okay. Can you able to hear, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful, inspiring, motivational speak on behalf of IHRD. Thank you for your wonderful speak. So I have got a few questions uh, to you. One is regarding. What is your regard, uh, I mean, reaction regarding, say, when you, uh, you said that uh, the bowlers or batsmen will curse you uh, while doing a wrong umpire. What is your reaction, number one? Number two, how do you become an umpire, BCC umpire or ICC umpire? What are the steps to become an ICC umpire? Third question is, uh, do you, can you justify when a ball pitches on the leg side of a batsman he can never be out. Can you be able to explain three questions, sir? I do. I, I repeat the question because uh, Principal Jacob told us. So he asked three questions. One, uh, I said about players cursing. How do you react? How do you take it? That is one. Second, how do you become an umpire? And third is uh, there's a question about cricket when the ball is outside the next room, the batsman cannot be able to do How do you get that? Cursing it is very simple. Now, uh, we have five minutes. I will say an incident that happened in my very first match. Uh, this was a match played between Bihar and Jhar. Uh, Bihar and Trubura in a place called Ranchi, Loni Songo. I was 26 years old and going to open my first Sanjay Pocket match. As you know, those days we did not have 12 wickets in Kerala. Only matching wickets were there. And 12 wickets is where the spinners can turn the ball, the ball jumps, all sorts of things can happen. I reached Sanchi after three days playing journey. Reached there, went to the ground, and uh, things were practicing. So the other umpire was there, and I went to the middle to inspect the pitch. We found that the pitch had been not been prepared properly because Bihar had good left us to put out Ashwini. So they wanted to defeat Rubra quickly and win the match, so they prepared another prepared match. When I went to the middle and examined some people were asking, hey, go ahead. So someone so these turn back, they didn't touch our head. So I did not look the size and the thing of the other. Not the system, this thing to start. So when the match started next day, I prayed heavily that Ashwini Kumar would not walk from my age. That was my only prayer when I I pray a lot before I do it. So I did that prayer, I went to the middle. But as luck would have, after one hour, this guy Ashwini Kumar comes, he's the cap and then left arm over. That's the whole left arm and my heart. He's a burly six footer, uh, Bihari type. And it's passed over, went out without a problem. Next door, there's a huge appeal for LBW. I thought it was normal, so I said, no, no. They all glared at me. The very next door, there was one more appeal. Somebody died, picked up the ball, the appeal for catch. Everyone was jumping up and down. I again said, no. The speed, pin drop silence on the ground. How is that? I said, no. They took one more step forward. Uh, are you blind? So I know better than the react. I just kept going. I could see he was boiling. He turned around and announced, He's not just blind, but also deaf. Good joke, no. That's why they were on me, so I couldn't laugh. And uh, my first match, my heart was beating, uh, sweating. 
I just kept it. Two hours after that, well, Ashwin Kumar got on the straight enough, I gave the little LBW. Then Saba Karim, who was living, he, he's just a commentator, living Bihar, came to me to talk to him. He said, sir, you missed that, sir. It's a clear catch. And I told him, Mr. Saba Karim, and the umpire said, no, no, there is no catch. He was good. I said, right. I don't know what happened to the right side, but after that, those people did not appear. They thought that either I was dumb and dumb and blind, or that I was beyond anything, or maybe not a poor or the water that we could get. These are the lessons. I'm thinking that you don't like being cursed. So if someone appeals and I give an order by going back, he will describe the body parts of my mother with a colorful term. Many times I feel like I don't have a sister by but then that's not good. But you don't like it. But then at the end of the day, you see it all as part of the game. Nothing is personal. You are just giving men to his disappointment. You, you, you learn to take it in that way. So, uh, and as I said, that keeps you grounded. So there are many times in life when you face difficult situations. When people tell me, my job is to have a certificate. I don't know. I don't know. There's nothing I can do. But then they give out their uh, emotions, give into their emotions in that way. So you have to take it in your spine. Second, how does one become an umpire? Actually, these days, every district association, you have to go to the association and pass a basic preliminary test, which is enrolled you at the district level umpire. Once you are a district level umpire and you umpire district level matches, you, they nominate you for the state level, for which there is a clinic forward bearing. From the state level, you uh, Compare more matches across the state, and they nominate you for the next level. There's an exam which goes to BCC. At BCC, you first you compare the junior, then you compare the first class. After which, you compare the senior matches on a regular basis. Then you go to the ICC panel. So, there's a very clear progression line which BCC does very well. So, that is the way you become an actor. Third is about the laws of the game, about what teaching out there the next step. Well, this was a law which was formed because English men couldn't play with text. What they used to do those days was that when the ball is pitched out there, like they just kick their pads out so that they don't become a bit of it. So, this was their strategy, and that's the So, beauty is that leg spinners learn to get around it. The person like Shane Ward made the ball pitch outside the and the play would be off pitch. He could do that. Leg spinners developed the googly very well, so leg spinners actually innovated and invented mechanics of the get over the university. So, on the face of it, even though it is restrictive, it actually led to the blooming of the art of leg spin. So, I agree with you when you say that it is not very fair, but on the other side, it has resulted in the evolution of the art of leg spin through the hands of people like Shane Maher and uh, uh, B.S. Chandrasekhar and uh, Abdul Khadr and the likes. I hope I have answered that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And what is the experience of your different career that has helped you contribute to carry us one of the most common resources? So, uh, I remember this. I had an earlier meeting problem. I was in the Rubber Market Department for two years. So, you will know, I, I don't own even one number three or I don't know the basics of it. I didn't know anything about the basic stuff, and I, I was just thinking that I was logging in for two years. Uh, the Rubber Board is an organization which works for the welfare of rubber farmers primarily and upstream to develop entrepreneurs. So, if any of you want to develop a rubber product, something to do with rubber technology, you have to approach the Rubber Board, they have an incubation center so that you can help to develop the product. What I could contribute as a listing was to bring a greater cohesion and harmony. In the producers and the So, you produce rubber, it's one of the most versatile raw materials known. It is flexible, it is waterproof, and it is strong. These three characteristics are not there in many businesses. So, and it is a natural material. So, it finds use in almost 40,000 products. In India, you can put it 10,000. So, there is tremendous potential for improving the use of rubber. So, what we are trying to do is one to Increase the product of rubber, bring in more cost effective methods so that the farmers are able to bear the brunt of the fluctuating prices and the consumer sector to be a 
very vibrant world. Right now, it is totally dependent on fire. The non-fire sector should develop more. So that is what we have been trying to focus. So it is, I wouldn't say it is my wisdom, it's the collective wisdom of everyone involved. And, and of course, uh, the minister uh, and, and the other public also. It's the collective wisdom. Just that when you are heading an organization like this, you only contribute a certain research, but the other part is actually taken care of by people who have been there before you and the public who actually get the benefit from.